But in 2007, she published a book entitled Shanghai Splendor, Economic Sentiments and the Making of Modern China that some of us also have read. She's published two other uh, books and co-edited or edited 10 others, as well as over 30 articles in professional journals. Dr. Ye began her formal education in history in Taiwan and received her PhD from UC Berkeley, where she's currently professor of history and director of the Institute of East Asian Studies. She's the chairholder of the Richard and Laurie Morrison Professor in History. In addition to her membership in uh, professional societies, Dr. Ye has also served on the Board of Commissioners for our Asian Art Museum. And as you can imagine, she's received many fellowships and awards. Dr. Ye has planned a long period of time for questions this morning, hoping to stimulate an active dialogue with us about this very dynamic period in Shanghai. And I know that for uh, those of us who are touring the exhibition, we're getting lots of interesting questions from the people who take our tours that can be part of the dialogue as well. So I'm gonna ask you first to join me in turning off your cell phones, and second to join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Ye. I understand from uh, uh, Jane that uh, um, many of you in the audience have already had a chance to uh, look at that uh, chapter. It's entitled A Tale of Three Cities about the history of, Hong Kong, uh, of uh, Shanghai from 1850 to the present. So uh, I will try not to repeat many of the points already made in that uh, um, essay, except perhaps to underscore some of the highlights. And I would also uh, like to explain that from the outset, the assignment given to me by Michael Knight was simply to provide the kind of historical backdrop that would help contextualize the presentation of the art pieces which are being on this show at the Asian Art Museum. So given that, what I would like to do this morning with a limited amount of time is simply to refresh our memories of major outlines of Shanghai's urban history from 1850 to the present. And within that context, to suggest the sort of historical backdrop underpinning the production as well as the reception of those images that we now associate with uh, Shanghai glamour and its modernity. So with that being our operating plan, let me simply move into the presentation. First of all, I'd like to argue that Shanghai in the, uh, in the present day for um, a majority of tourists going to Shanghai today, one would see this as a city of east and west. That is the way that the tourist trade would have people oriented is to take people down a river tour, river cruise right around here with the prime area right here. And to suggest that there are two Shanghai or two cities, one on the eastern side of the, um, of the um, um, Huangpu River, referred to as Pudong. And this is the area where the expo is going to take place. And actually back here, more in this direction is where the new airport is to be. And connecting be roughly from here to here is the maglev, the high speed maglev that would cover the distance of about 22 miles in seven minutes for anybody getting into the Shanghai International Airport or leaving here. And then from here to connect with a web of subways, which would take people not only to this part of the city, but also to a lesser extent, actually, 
up and down the Huangpu River. Now, of course, this been the newest part of Shanghai. These are areas of um, science and technology parts, industrial parks, and the expo. And then uh, I would say right around here is where that landmark Pearl of the Orient stands. So that's eastern part of Shanghai. And then the western part of Shanghai is to Shanghai, especially in this area where these two rivers run into each other. This is the old Shanghai, or referred to sometimes as the Puxi area, meaning west of the Huangpu River. And this is, that whole stretch is the uh, fabulous Bunch, which just uh, most recently, maybe of last week, um, had a new inauguration, that is with many of these old colonial buildings constructed at the turn of the 20th century, being renovated and reopened. So tourist maps of today's Shanghai would, strike, would impress you with the difference between east and west. The Shanghai of industry, technology, high-tech transportation, of uh, deep, um, uh, of uh, seaport, of airport, of subway connections and of Shangri-La hotels, Grand Hyatt hotels and whatnot, the Shanghai of the future of modernity of finance. Whereas this part west of the river would be the Shanghai of its past, of its history, of its glamour, and of some of its more important landmarks. So for our purpose, when we speak of Shanghai glam glamour, the geographical locus is by and large right this area, especially where the two rivers run into each other and right along this edge. Now that is largely the result of, of the circumstances of Ch Shanghai's history, namely what we now lumped in together as one Western Shanghai, a hundred years ago, would have been understood by the locals, in fact, as two Shanghais, with divisions between north and south. <clears throat> the northern part is the international settlement where the British and the American consuls were actually consular officials, were in fact the ones presiding or leading a mixed court with regard to all commercial and civil code affairs in the event of any, dis um, any uh, dispute between foreign nationals and Chinese residents. And then further south is the French concession. These are areas commonly referred to as foreign concessions in Shanghai. And the, with the original Chinese city being, the, um, uh, being referred to in English literature in those days roughly as the native city. So the way that this all evolved, you see, I right, real, realize that we are telling a historical story backwards, namely from present day back to the original. So if we follow the historical sequence, at the very beginning, when people referred to Shanghai, there was only one Shanghai, which was this one. And that was as recent as 1843. In November 1843, when the first party of um, British merchants, alongside with somebody who was going to become the United Kingdom's very first Consul General in China. When they arrived in November 1843 in um, Shanghai, they more or less, I mean, they sailed all the way from the Huangpu up the river and all the way down to the, to the foot of the uh, city wall right there. They moored there overnight and next morning, when they woke up, they realized that they had already 
attracted the attention of the local magistrate who was situated inside the walled compounds of this city. And then in the backdrop all around this area was what the British would come to refer to as the big flat or the muddy flat of marshland. And then of course, from these colonial accounts, they would say marshlands with nothing but weed and mosquitoes. Now then, I suppose I suggest that we would take simply as a way for um, very common in colonial discourse for colonialists to congratulate themselves on the hardships that they had endured on their own perseverance and then of course on the civilizing mission that they might have to undertake in uh, their new home. So in the 18, we're now talking about 1840s, roughly with this area has been completely build up a Chinese city with its magistrate, with its merchants, with its shops, with its poets, with its gardens, with its fine cuisine, all of that, and the British coming in. Initially, actually, been invited to stay in the city, but they felt rather uncomfortable after a while. For one thing, wherever they went, they tend to attract the following of a group of curious local teenagers who simply couldn't took their eyes off these Englishmen as the British went through whatever that they were doing in those days. So shortly after that, uh, the uh, British Council and the Shanghai Magistrate agreed on an arrangement so that chunks of this area would be turned into permanent lease land for the English and for them to build as well as to govern. The international settlement starting from a modest origin right around here, and it wasn't very significant in size, only about 800 acres or so, was going to expand by about 10 times its original size over the period of next century. And the outcome of that was that the international settlement would become de facto a colony of British and American jointly administrated colony on Chinese land. And this would also be the kind of colonial presence where there will be church, schools, hospitals, fire brigades, municipal councils, um, ratepayers associations, a voluntary army, and the police force. So with all of that in place, this was de facto British territory from roughly 1843 all the way to about 1942. 1942, as you might recall, was the year after Pearl Harbor. In other words, 1942 was the year that is in, this, uh, in November, uh, in December 1941, exactly on November 8th, 1941. Japanese troops marched into this area in the aftermath of Pearl Harbor. In other words, there was a de facto Japanese occupation of this part of the town. Now this part of the town went over to a Vichy appointed French consul, which was in collaboration with Japanese authorities in the 1940s during the Pacific War. So my point here, it's simply not to get things too complicated, it's simply to say by 1942, the free French, uh, France government of General de Gaulle and the um, government in uh, London jointly declared that they gave up 
on their extraterritoriality rights in China. Now, extraterritoriality extra rights in China by any of the major European powers were based on this treaty in 1843, the same treaty that brought the first British Council to this part of China to launch this whole area. And this was a treaty prerogative that allowed foreign councils in China to build their own courts, to assign their own judges, and to try court cases involving their own nationals using the rules of or the laws of their home countries rather than that of China. Does that seem to make sense? Yes? Okay. So in, 18, um, in 1843, these rules of extraterritoriality and the mixed courts were put in place. We have the beginning of the foreign concessions. And in 1942, thanks in part to Japanese conquest of East Asia and Japanese military forces driving out the effective control of European colonial powers all across East Asia, not just in China, but all, all the way across Southeast Asia up to the brink of Burma and India, right? This, this happened, this Japanese um, imperial troops accomplished that uh, thrust by the summer of 1843 that European powers, France and um, Great Britain in particular, gave up their colonies essentially or their extraterritoriality rights inside China. So, so what we're talking about here then, that is for that whole hundred year period, is the kind of Shanghai concentrated in these two areas and then the, uh, with, a, with um, territorial divisions clearly demarcated on legal terms across one, two, and three parts of Shanghai. The Shanghai model, the sorts of middle class images that we speak about, it's, it's, um, was a phenomenon primarily taking place in this area. And this comes for a variety of reasons. Now, for much of the second half of the 19th century, this was the town, this was the larger town with a much higher percentage of population, whereas this was simply a developing place against the backdrop, against the opportunities that came with trade and missionary activities as well as diplomacy <clears throat> in this part of the city. The, um, the things, uh, the, uh, the balance of power um, which in 1843, namely one shipload of uh, British nationals and a town of about 400,000 Chinese people under a magistrate, that was 1843. That balance began to shift quite discernibly in the 1860s. And the reason for that was in China's interior, elsewhere, outside of Shanghai, there was warfare. The Taiping's uprising disrupted peace and order upstream up this river and then also up the Yangtze River into this area as well as in this area. Which means wealthy people in China's hinterland, Suzhou and Hangzhou, much further south, these wealthy people sought refuge in Shanghai, where in these two places, thanks to the presence of foreign troops, the Taipings decided to stay out. So this was the beginning 
over the course of the second uh, from 1860s all the way to the 1940s of massive immigration or influx of Chinese population into Shanghai. And by now, by, by Shanghai, we have in mind principally this part and in an ancillary way, this part, the foreign concessions of Shanghai. And why do people come? It's because foreign concessions in Shanghai in those days were represented, relatively speaking, a haven of peace and the kind of place that would allow people protection away from the warring parties, either, well, the, uh, the triads took this town and in all these other places uh, elsewhere. So roughly speaking, between 1860s and 1940s, Shanghai, or the foreign concession of Shanghai, this part, the population of Shanghai grew by about, I mean, depending on how you do your account, if you start out by saying that this, the population here was virtually close to zero, or under a thousand people, by 1942, for this area alone, plus here, it was over four million. Now, at no time at all, in any given um, point in time, was the foreign population, that is non-Chinese population, coming from multiple other countries, ever exceeded the number of 15,000. So we can count for ourselves, namely of these four million, how many were Europeans, Japanese, or non-Chinese, or as how many of them were right from here. And of these four million people coming to uh, Shanghai, people came for two reasons. The first reason, as mentioned already, was to seek safety, relative safety, away from warfare. So in the 1860s, it happened on large scale for the gentry elite, the wealthy people of Suzhou and Hangzhou to come in large numbers. And it happened for a second time in the late 1930s when China and Japan went to war and this entire region fell into Japanese occupation. So for that second period, when uh, Japanese troops took all of these parts, surrounding parts, as well as this part. The people coming into these two foreign concessions included refugees from here, from here, all the surrounding areas, immediate area uh, neighborhoods of Shanghai going into just these two parts, especially this part of Shanghai, so as to seek relative safety from Japanese troops. So people come, first of all, for safety, and then people come for a second reason, namely for the jobs that the expanding maritime trade, going through the Huangpu River and so forth, that the expanding maritime trade and the opportunities that the international settlement represented at the time. Now, as I mentioned, in the 1840s, the Council General took along with him a shipload, or a boatload, I should say, of merchants. There were only 13 of them and no women aboard for the first arrival, which was from uh, Calcutta. Well, so that was nearly 1843. And by 1890s, what we refer to as the Bund today, along here, was pretty much in construction. Those buildings served the purposes of trading companies as well as of financial institutions. In other words, banks, especially the leading bank, the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation was the leading bank in Shanghai in those days and primarily in the business 
of servicing the shipping and the importing and exporting of goods. So shipping firms, financial institutions, trading firms were the mainstay of Shanghai business right along the Bund in those days. And coming along with it, of course, warehouses, go-downs, um, dock workers, and uh, whatnot right around that area. In the second tier, you have the structures for the municipal building of churches and of schools, hospitals, fire brigades, and the police forces, as I mentioned already. So what do you do then that is for a few thousand people, uh, Englishmen primarily, trying to trade, not just with this part of China, but all the rest of China, what do you do in order to help accomplish that goal? Namely, with a minority trading population trying to accomplish its trade missions with a vast continent. Well, it didn't take very long for enterprising young Shanghai people to discover that there was a life to be had if one were simply to master English as a commercial language. So where do you learn English? Well, they went to church schools. Several church denominations offered that kind of English language instruction as early as the 1850s teaching young Chinese how to speak English. And going from there, by the 1890s and well into the 1920s, we have church-sponsored colleges and universities teaching a full range of subjects, including business management, finance, economics, world geography, international law, not to mention, of course, subjects on religion and English literature. The subject, these were um, church, church sponsored universities offering these subjects emerged by the 1920s to become some of the most prestigious universities in Shanghai or colleges and universities in Shanghai. So there was the Baptist-sponsored Shanghai Baptist College. All these schools are right in this area. But then above all, there was the Episcopalian Yale University-sponsored or co-sponsored St. John's University, which if you look, check through their uh, alum roster, was the uh, um, alma mater of in the end of some of China's leading financiers of the 1930s as well as of the 1940s. Now, once you have a young enterprising Chinese uh, constituency there graduating with college degrees in all these subjects, um, proficient in English, Western in their styles and habits, right? They they play what they play uh, soccer, they play tennis, they swim, and uh, they attend church choir activities. They uh, perform Shakespeare. They have Shakespeare events, and they have they uh, put on charity balls. You have a whole Westernized middle-class uh, urban culture developing around these young people who came from mercantile families of affluence, who were being educated or being trained to become the executives and top leaders of Shanghai's finance, manufacturing, and in the end, publishing, higher education, uh, printing business, um, trade, and whatnot. And you also have the kind of heavily YMCA or YWCA centered social clubs introducing young people of China 
to do essentially what we would expect students at Stanford, at Berkeley, um, at American colleges to do. And they've also got among the ranks of their instructors, young graduates from precisely these American universities going to China to teach English for a year or for a summer. And I believe that that's a practice that continues to be fashionable these days, judging among the choices of my own students at Berkeley. Anyway, so by and large, that was the backdrop for the emergence of a middle class in the city itself. And by the city, it's by and large this part, the English speaking, much less so the French speaking part of the city, and certainly was this part of the city pretty much completely left out. So what do we have in terms of the kinds of uh, Shanghai glamour or Shanghai images that we are seeing here in the, um, in the museum on its show? I would say uh, two things. First of all, Shanghai clearly had been a city from its outset, from the 1840s onward, and you one could argue that all the way up to 1949 was a hiatus for the next 30 years, but picking up again in that kind of momentum in the um, 1890s, um, in the 1980s, Shanghai clearly has been a city of migration. And this has been a migration taking place against the backdrop either of enormous business opportunities or against the backdrop of tumultuous warfare and social uprising. So a couple or out of that context, it became possible for about two decades or so between the 1920s and 1930s for the city to host a middle class life and to have the kind of articulation of middle class sophistication and middle class modernity predicated on the value of nuclear family, of education, of middle class positions, of advertising, of fashion, of cosmopolitan connections. But that, in the broader schema of things, was a phenomenon taking place against the backdrop, on the one hand, of enormous social unrest within the city of Shanghai itself. For we must not forget that pre that was exactly in 1921, pretty much the same time that we witnessed the birth of this Shanghai glamour, that we also see the birth of the Chinese Communist Party right there in the city. The very first, the first party congress of the Chinese Communist Party took place in Shanghai in those days, in 1921. And this was taking place in the uh, French part of the city, the French concession, this part of the city. So what, we're, what that means is simply this, that at the same time as we have an affluent or a culture of affluence and sophistication that's finding expression in this kind of highly commercialized and cultured existence of a middle class of women and children and peacetime aspirations for progression uh, for professional career and professional progress in arenas of finance, trade, manufacturing, and whatnot. We have, at the same time, a, la a large, a vast uh, underclass of working class um, population in this city, which were in alliance with a smaller number of Chinese um, intellectuals, many of them not at all English speaking. Instead, these were Chinese intellectuals coming from this part of the town or elsewhere. In other words, educated Chinese, 
coming in, non、uh, English speaking, and forming alliance with the underclass of this rapidly westernizing, industrializing, and、uh, manufacturing Shanghai of the 1920s and 1930s. So, the kinds of images that we have then. For instance, something like this. If we take all that social history into account, as one of these,、um, um, a poster image like this, what would that have? Well, first of all, this is for Coca Cola, which wasn't exactly a Chinese brand. Secondly, the person who's presumably sitting there selling it, inviting you to drink Coke. Obviously, it's a Chinese girl.、Um, but then, if you look at her, how Chinese is she? I mean, this is an image from the 1920s. How does she look in comparison with the, the look of her mother or her grandmother? How does she look within the matter of some, a single generation? Or how, how does this appearance contrast with, say, Chinese women? From Beijing or from Chengdu, in other words, from China's interior in the 1920s or 1930s. Well, obviously, the chipao that she's wearing stands for the high fashion of the time. The silk that's the fabric of this chipao, there is a better than 50% chance that it's not Chinese silk. The top line of the silk in Chinese market in those days for women's fashion is probably either Japanese or French. And then the third part of it was well, look at the accessories, right?、Um, the, uh, uh, the, the pearl earring and then also her watch, as well as, as um, uh, the ring. Well, believe me, I've sort of、uh, taken. Close looks of、uh, some of the jewelry that of that period that happened to come to me through uh, my uh, grandparents,、uh, my grandmother's collection. They don't look quite the same the way things are done at Tiffany's or Cartier. It's a different kind of design concept. On the other hand, they certainly do not look like the kind of thing that women. Of the 18th century or even late 19th century, will be wearing. Why? Because for an older generation of Chinese women, for personal、uh, adornment, jade and gold were the two most important things, far more important than pearl or diamond. And the other part of it was that a lot of that adornment. Would go into somebody with the assumption of a totally different kind of hairdo. In other words, you would have very long hair, very elaborate hairdo that would require the usage of tons of hairpins. Now, this woman obviously has no use of that, and this is the kind of hairdo that would be conceivable or possible only in a country in a setting in which the chemical industry. Knows what it's doing, right? Okay. Now, the rest of it, for for instance, the cosmetic part. If you look into、uh, the history of, say,、um, Max Factor versus Shiseido in the 1920s, you realize that Max Factor was eons ahead of Shiseido, and it was precisely because Shiseido in Japan. Was only beginning to figure out through its chemical industry how to mass produce cosmetic products for women. And China in those days, now Shanghai in the 1920s and 30s, was a prime importer of this kind of machine-manufactured high-end cosmetics for women. The、um, old-fashioned stuff, such as you go out there, pick your flowers, do the pounding, do the creaming, etc., that you might be able to find somewhere 
but certainly not in the stores of Shanghai. Okay, so that goes for lipstick, everything, eyebrows, and whatever. And then, ultimately, this whole gesture, which was borrowed from inviting people for a toast, right? Inviting people to come uh, for for a drink and to share a toast. I did a little bit of poking around once upon a time, uh, namely, as you know, um, the whole practice of drinking, of drinking wine, um, especially say drinking in the um, in the context of carrying on a conversation over a meal, and be an intimate gesture between two people. That in China is actually in Chinese practice is actually. Quite an innovative thing, even today. In other words, the usage of alcohol or of drinks for intimacy—it's either something that you do all by yourself. You drink, you drink your own tea. You don't bother to invite anybody to drink alongside with you, or you drink at a banquet setting. And then, then in that case. It's not about an invitation to intimacy. It's about a sharing of communal sensitivity. So, what is this woman doing here? Then, I mean, she's selling Coca-Cola. She's offering gestures, and she looks very Chinese. The, by the way, I mean, there's a whole piece of um, one could do a whole um, treatise on this. About the interior decor of Chinese houses in this period of time, and if anyone were to do that kind of research, we, I'm, I'm aware that we have some、uh, cabinets and furniture pieces out there. I would certainly invite you, suggest that you take a close look at that. But then, for these furnitures to be there, right? First of all, I mean they don't they don't look very Chinese. In comparison with the kind of say imperial furniture pieces that you would see in a palace museum, and secondly, it's the kind of fabric, right, or the kind of wood paneling that once again would require availability of materials. In this case,、um, Michael Knight informed me the other day that、um, for the construction. Of these palatial or manor-style Chinese houses in Shanghai in the 1920s and 1930s, guess where the log actually came from? Exactly. So that you have to have a whole shipping industry, and then also connect it with that for the、uh, for the material to be available, and for that particular style of furniture to become available. And then,、um, for、um, for a room to be so specialized, rather than simply an open space with multiple functions, that could be shared with other members of the family, and then also with the functionality shifting from occasion to occasion, that was also something that was new in this case. Now I don't have the images to show it to you, but I, in my own research, I did、um, come across, for instance, the advertisements of a company that specialized in making、um, cotton,、uh, cotton fabric, and going from cotton to cotton towels. And the purpose of cotton towels was, was of course, for shower and uh, for uh,、um, hand towel,、uh, face towel, and whatnot. And this person. For the purpose, or this company, for the purpose of selling bath towels, hand towels, and、uh, facial towels, went into the construction of an entire showroom, in which it tried to underscore two points: one, it is a good idea that you take a bath at least once a day. Now, of course, if you wish to sell Towels, bath towels. You have to get people to take to take baths or to take showers. But then, Chinese homes in Shanghai in the 1920s and 1930s 
a majority of those were houses without running water. So where do you go if you want to take a bath? There were specialized bathhouses where you go to, and people offer you a massage and so forth. And those people who were who worked as attendants for those bathhouses were actually looked down upon. They were seen as people in this kind of servile um, um, industries, and merely slightly just a cut above prostitution. But anyway. The point for us to make here is that if you're going to sell tons and tons of bath towels, you need to get people into the habit of taking a bath each day. If you want that to be a daily convenience, you have to build a house that actually has running water and has bath tops or showers. And if you're going to do something like that. Then you need to be in a neighborhood where there are actually right municipal supplies of water, and perhaps even hot water, and、um, a whole line of other things going into the construction of a bathroom. And yes, in Shanghai, if that's what you want, or you go for that, well, I think there is very good reason for the international settlement. To be the prime real estate location, because it featured a municipal council that offered electricity, that offered running water, and even though it required people to pay higher tax than the Chinese part of the city, nonetheless there were people willing to go along with that. And when the population inside the municipal council or the international settlement grew to such intensity or density that there was actually Chinese support for the international council to reach beyond its originally agreed borders, the so-called extra、um, extra boundary roads or road constructions in Shanghai. In those days, but anyway, so so that's point number one. And then the second point is that apart from the material side of building, enabling households to build bathtubs, it's also crucial that you sell your customer the concept of a whole style of life built around something like the virtue, the health benefits. Of taking a bath every day, right? It's mean. I much. I don't think we need. We need to elaborate on that. Just think about what we do these days with health food, organic products, um, which, um, losing weight, uh, exercising more. In other words, going to Whole Foods to do your grocery shopping is not just about that one chunk of beef or one head of lettuce. It's about selling you. The entire concept about the way you live your life, and advertisers in Shanghai in the 1920s and 1930s, when they were trying to sell bath towels, they had already figured out how that this had to be a comprehensive package of everything. So the comprehensive package here would require or would involve what?、Well, we've already touched on these points, namely nuclear family, healthy children. You have your puppy, you have your、uh, marble on the floor, and you've also got this、uh, colonnaded Western-style、uh, um, household construction. And the whole point about this kind of colonnaded or indoor/outdoor、um, home is that you get your share of、uh, fresh air, and you are less likely going to get sick. The、um, some of these uh, uh, the、um, the products, however, right? This continue to be well. This is this is Western style suits, and which was practically the uniform. For Shanghai businessmen in、uh, the Bund area, 
whereas this woman wears that, uh, which continues to be seen as very much a Chinese costume. But how Chinese is that? Well, so that brings us to this other side of the story, namely an image of this sort, an image of this sort obviously had to be done both with the consent and the contribution of Chinese businessmen. These Chinese manufacturers were obviously solely products that would look very strange or very novel from the perspectives of their parents or their uh, grandparents or from their cousins from China's interior, namely the entire design concept and uh, even the outfits themselves, shall we say, are Western. So from that sense, they were doing things that were truly not very Chinese, that's un-Chinese. On the other hand, these were people who were Chinese manufacturers using Chinese workers and Chinese capital to produce something for the consumption of the Chinese customers. In other words, in contrast with something which was a downright import, these are products referred to as China's national goods. So national goods has Chinese ownership, even though it had unconventional or untraditional content attached to it which makes it national, which, well, it's national, not just because this is Chinese products for Chinese consumption. It's also that it's because Chinese manufacturers were doing things in the way with helpful advice. So Chinese people can lead a very healthy, robust Chinese life, which is simultaneously Chinese and modern. So my point is simply this, that many of these images that we are looking at are products, are, are results of sophisticated advertising and marketing campaigns. Much of that mounted by Chinese capital and at the same time inspired by Western concepts. The ultimate objective was simply to convey the public or to outline the possibility of a modern style of life that could be comfortably Chinese. You don't have to be compromised as a colonialist to wear Western style clothing. Things could be middle class, modern, as well as comfortably Chinese. And this is the kind of construction that takes place quite deliberately. And this, this is a photograph of, uh, this is a photograph as opposed to the images before. And this one uh, is the, uh, on the cover of uh, one of Shanghai's uh, famed um, uh, journals of its days. Now, the fashion industry, and here, Qtex and whatnot, the chemical industry does have to do its bidding, except that you could also see how clumsy the um, advertising design itself it, it, uh, is at the time. In other words, color printing remained very expensive in those days. So you have to calculate the cost of the advertisement. All right. So this was, I mean, all of those feminine charm, affluence, um, the allure of the Western and the modern was in some ways set against a real life backdrop, as I mentioned, of migration, of working class discontent, of massive wartime devastation, and the uh, visual expression of that sort of experience tends to come in something like this, namely woodblock printing. You could see here is this person at his desk 
Now this image, in contrast with these posters, this is very masculine, not a woman. And then the other part of it was he was using, working, using his pen and abacus. And this is yet another woodblock image, again, showing the devastation or the destitution against the backdrop of all those wonderful things, the landmarks of the Bund. The landmarks of the Bund, right, we see here the custom house. This is the uh, Hong Kong, uh, the, uh, the uh, landmark building on the Bund of the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation. And women and children, especially the clothing of this woman as well as the hairdo, right? This is the kind of hairdo that could use a lot of jade and gold hairpins, but obviously not the bobbed hair. And um, well, it's not exactly the kind of hand for reins. So those were images up to 1949, before the, before the war. And here comes the triumph of the new republic after 1949. And these are Chinese ships of majestic power pulling into the port. Here is an artistic rendition of a view of the Shanghai Bund, right? You could see this is somewhat eerie, as if the, the two eyes in some sort of a Batman cartoon uh, of the top of the uh, Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation right here. And this is a view from the dock workers' uh, vantage point, and this is on the other side of the Huangpo River. Now, this is the site, of course, right? Today is exactly the site of the new Shanghai and of Pudong as well as of the Chinese Expo. In other words, once upon a time, this was the backward farmland and and uh, peering across the river, looking on with ambivalence, right, over the setting sun, even though it's the setting sun. Nonetheless, this is a view, well, someone standing from a position of not very much and looking across the Huangpu River at the setting sun over the colonial centers of finance industry, import, export, and all that glamour. This is an image from the early 50s. Now, that's an, an image, once again, of some of those uh, older buildings um, in, into the 60s. And once again, into the 60s. And finally, and this is the renovated Bunch. This is an image, uh, this is a the top of uh, of the, uh, the uh, Shanghai Western Hotel, right? And here in the, in the front, this is the renovated uh, front, the uh, Bund of the old Shanghai and Hong Kong Banking Corporation. Now, this is the old Shanghai regaining its glamour, but this is also the old Shanghai reclaiming its glamour um, in the context of this old farmland, the eastern part of, uh, of the uh, Hongpu River being constructed into something that's super modern. In other words, the old western part of the city is now safely claimed to be Chinese, precisely as a moment when the colonial memories and colonial nostalgia no longer stand in a position to threaten an emerging sense of China's postmodern modern, which of course would have to be something up today. So let me leave you with that as our final image and welcome your questions. Thank you.